Thank you for everybody else being with us today. We're going to, if you can go ahead and we're going to, I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm going to read the scripture that we're coming from today. And then I'm going to invite our guest communicator up, which is not really a guest. He's part of the family. Yeah. But if you'll turn to Psalms 25, I want to read to some, some things to you today. I had a friend of mine send me his daily Bible verse that was actually out of Psalms 25. So um, God's really working and trying to show up in people's lives and prove to them that he's real, that he wants to heal them, he wants to save them. Um, he just wants to do something special in their life. I apologize, I sound like Clint Eastwood's little brother today, um, <clears throat> but I've been shouting all weekend. Psalms 25, David, David writing um, to God about the fact that he's, he really wants to overcome shame. He really wants to walk in integrity and character, and, and he realizes that um, that can only come from God and that his salvation is only from God. And so we're going to pick up. I'm going to read, kind of skip around a little bit. I won't read all of Psalms 25. Verse 1 says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. Verse 4, Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. Verse 7, do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your love and kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the right way. He leads the humble in justice and he teaches the humble his way. Pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way he should, go, he should choose. His soul will abide in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The secret of the Lord is for those who honor him, and he will make them to know his covenant. My eyes are continually toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the trap. Verse 20 and 21. Guard my soul and deliver me. Do not let me be ashamed. For I take refuge in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I will look to you, O Lord. God is great. He's good. He's faithful. But there are, there are things in our life that we struggle with all the time. And, and a lot of times it's, it's traps that the enemy has set for us. And we get sucked in by them. And sometimes they look like addictions. Sometimes they look like strongholds. Sometimes they look like um, repetitive habits. Sometimes they look like self-medication. And then you have a person who will overcome that and be set free by God. And, but he will be locked in by shame, unable to forgive himself or herself. And if the enemy can't keep you down with an addiction or a struggle or a stronghold, then what he will do is once God delivers you, he will, flip, he will flip it and he'll have you walk in shame all your life. And you'll accept the forgiveness of God, but you'll never forgive yourself. And you'll even forgive others who, who hurt you. But because you don't see yourself worthy of true forgiveness, it will be most difficult for you to forgive yourself. And that's the thing we kind of want to talk about today. Uh, Steve and I are going to deal with addictions through his story, power of redemption, the fact that God can forgive, but then also how a man, how a woman, how a person walks through forgiving themselves so they can step in to who they were created Come to on. be. So without further ado, my friend, my brother, would you welcome Steve Weatherford to the platform, please? Before I sit down in these little midget seats, uh, you guys can have a seat. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to honor a few people. I wanted to honor you all. I wanted to honor Decatur. I want to honor this house. Man, dude, I saw God moving here in the last two days. It was supernatural. Um, so I'm just super blessed, super honored to be here, just exactly where my feet are at. Um, I wanted to honor Wojo. I know uh, he's in here somewhere. He's been the guy that's uh, been carrying my armor in order for me to get up here and and do what God sent me to do and, and speak my freedom story. Um, would you guys mind actually pulling up that picture of my family? So this is my family. Uh, before I really tell you too much more about myself, I wanted to honor you and I wanted to honor your wife because my marriage was under attack, like hardcore six months ago. And, um, and, and God brought a powerful man into my life that like spoke my language. 
You know what I mean? And there's like, there's a lot of churches I'm sure in this area, but man, there's only one epic church. And I'm so thankful to God that there's only one Ivy Marsh, bro. Like I'm so thankful for you. And don't get me started on Mama Bear. My goodness. I thought I saw a possibility in a man, but man, I have never seen a wife like you in my life. In my life. And like the, the amazing blessing of the spiritual father and the spiritual mama bear that you guys have inside of this church is they're so generous with their breakthrough. They're so generous with what God did in their life. He's so generous with what happened to him when he was a little boy. That's strength, that's power to me because it's men like that that will show their scars that will allow little boys like me and you to heal so we can step into the family that God created us to have and be the leader that he created us to have. And so that shame and that guilt of what happened to us or what we did or the thoughts that are still running through our mind, that is not who we are. We get to come around mighty men and mighty women like you and we get to take those thoughts captive. And so, man, I'm just pr praying and believing in the name and the mighty undefeated name of Jesus that he's gonna speak to you, that his spirit of the living God in this room through this conversation that we're gonna have, it's gonna speak to your struggle, it's gonna speak to your pain. And it's not just gonna identify it, it's gonna offer you a solution, it's gonna offer you a power and a peace to be able to step into. And so I just wanted to honor you, Benet, and I wanted to honor you, Ivy, man, I love you guys. Um, a house divided cannot stand, and I know there's a God calling on my life to do this until yeah. I'm dead. Yeah. But the devil wants to take that out, how's he gonna take that out? He's gonna to talk to my wife in San Diego, California when I'm out here serving the king, yeah. the best that I know how. He's gonna to whisper to her, oh, he's, he's wasting time, the stuff he's doing, it, it, it doesn't really matter, he should be making money. That's how he divides it. But I've got somebody that's standing in the gap with my wife, that's, that's covering me while I'm serving the king. So without you, Benet, I'm promising you I can't be me. I know you don't speak to me on the phone and you don't speak life into me as much as you speak life into my wife, but you're speaking life into my heart when you armor her up. So I thank you and I love you. Let's get this party started. Don't worry. Thank you, Steve. And I gotta honor one other person, my man, Tevin, right there. Not, oh, not only did he give me napkins before I came up here, hold up what you got underneath your table. He's got paper towels under there. Cause we might need bounty tonight. The quicker picker upper, man, cause I am here to speak my truth. And sometimes emotions come out, man, and I'm here to serve you. I'm here to serve the king. Let's go. Let's do it. Man, I hope y'all ready. Cause I'm- These seats I'm... are really low. <laughs> Because literally, like this is going to be like interview style, but here's what I'm, I'm about to get out to what. Um, I'm not going to leave you on the platform by yourself, but here's what I want you to do. Um, I just want you to speak to them your story, um, what you struggled with, how you accepted the forgiveness of God. But then I want you to transition into how you legitimately forgave yourself in a way that shame didn't hold you back so you could step into who you are. And feel free to stand up and move around because I don't want to lock you down, man, because I believe God's going to use you in a powerful way. So if y'all guys don't mind, I'm going to pray for him and I'm going to cut him loose. God, thank you so much for Steve. Father, thank you for his anointing. Thank you that he's your son. Thank you that he's forgiven, redeemed, and made whole. I thank you that uh, this weekend was a massive step into his destiny. And God, whatever a man gives you first, you bless the rest. And God, he has, gave, he has given you himself. He gave us all this weekend. He poured into lives, lives of men. And God, I know you're going to use him now to pour into the people that are under the sound of his voice. Move him out of the way. Let people see Jesus and hear your good news through him. And God, deliver people today. Heal people today. Set them free. Save them. Let them feel your grace, your love, and your mercy through the powerful words of your son, Steve Weatherford. In Jesus' name, amen. Crank it, man. Amen. All right. Um, thank you, Ivy. I love you, man. And the only reason he's sitting right there is just to make me comfortable. You ever seen, like, uh, I'm from Indiana, you know? And you ever seen, uh, I was saying this to Wojo the other day. Um, you ever heard of a calming goat? That's something that they, they put into a stable with a really nervous racehorse. 
You know, like a racehorse that could win a race, but without somebody by their side, they can't be what God created them to be. You're the goat, cuss. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was telling Mojo that the other day. I'm like, man, it's just like when you have a mighty man of God next to you who's been through some ish, you know what I mean, who has felt some pain and felt some struggle, just to know that he's there with me. It's just giving me comfort and speaking my truth. So I love you, man. Um, make sure you keep me on the, on the guardrails here. Um, so my story really, really began, a lot of the, the men that are in here that were here this, this morning or this weekend heard my story, and it really began when I was about five years old, and I realized just how different I am. Um, if you guys haven't noticed, I've got extreme ADHD, and I'm a little, a little emotional, um, but I believe that God, what I hated about myself as a five-year-old, God has, has given me just like a supernatural gifting because typically dudes don't come up here literally with their... their their jacket stuffed with napkins because they know that they're going to need it. But I believe that's the part of my, my, my gifting that I suppressed for so long. And what I believe that we suppress is going to depress us. And that's that, that gifting trying to get out. And I was a football player. You guys know I played in the NFL. Um, that's not somewhere that you exercise being really emotional and, and, and like a sensitive person. It's not like after practice we sit in the locker room and we're like, Let's talk about our feelings. How's your marriage? You know what I mean? No, oh, man, these dudes are like conspiring to keep their wives busy so they could go out and like nail anything that moves if I'm just keeping it real. It wasn't a place that we shared about what we're feeling inside. Um, and so I'll take you back to five years old. Dude, first day of kindergarten. The first five days in a row, I got sent to the principal's office because I couldn't sit still because I had ants in my pants. And they thought the solution was, oh, let's make him stand on the wall during recess because he's got ants in his pants. So let's make him sit still and watch all the other little kids get their wiggles out. And then I go back to class and get trouble, in trouble again. And so there was a system that was built essentially for me to resent myself. And I started to hate all of those giftings that I'm telling you guys about right now, like hyperactivity and, and impulsivity, like as an athlete, I make decisions quicker than other athletes because my brain is just wired that way, right? And at five years old, people don't help you to notice gifts about yourself. They want you to fit into the box. Does anybody, has anybody felt like people have tried to fit you into a box that you yeah. just don't fit into? Yeah. I felt like that way in religion too. Like I felt like, dude, I definitely, if I don't fit in school, I'm definitely not gonna fit in in Sunday school. I mean, it was to the point where I got kicked out of Sunday school. Because if there were six other kids and they're trying to learn about Jesus and you have one that's dis disrupting everything, single the problem out so everybody else can learn. And that's how I grew up. And I began to ha hate myself. And, and then at about eight years old, you know, my, my parents were like, man, this dude can't freaking sit still. We need to get him into some sports. And like a lot of them, like the ones where he runs the most. And so they put you in soccer, track, basketball, anything they can get me into. And all of a sudden, the light clicked. I'm valuable. And it wasn't like my daddy was saying like, great job, Steve, I'm proud of you. And I, like I said, I, you know, I grew up in the church and so we were in church every Sunday, but I had like one of those old school dads, you know, one of those, he would like teach you and parent you with just his eyes like, you know who I'm talking to, yeah, Kansas City hat. The guy that did, th hey, can we honor him real quick for 31 reps in bench press? <laughs> He's one of the mighty men that came to play this weekend. Um, but that was actually me telling you that I'm proud of you. I don't know if you caught that. was like my dad's there. <laughs> but you didn't know. But that's how my dad parented me. So it was never like, oh, I'm proud of you or I love you or words of affirmation. And so at eight years old, the only place that people would tell me like I'm a good boy would be when I was playing sports. Because if we were on a soccer team and, and we scored four goals and I scored three of them on the way to the car, I'd be walking with my dad and all the other parents would be like, oh my God, little Stevie, you're so good, man. Oh my gosh, you're great. And they would tell my dad how proud of me he should be. But I never heard those words from my dad, ever. Not even in a, in a, in a look that I could tell meant proud. Like I didn't even know how to do the translation of like, oh, that one was proud. That one was proud, I'd be. <laughs> I never knew that. I couldn't translate it. Every Sunday we'd go to church. My dad would show up in church and I love and honor my father. I want everybody to know that right now. But he's built different than what I needed in order for me to have my breakthrough of possibility, in order for me to see a man like IV when I'm like, that's what I wanna be. Or for me to see a wife, the way that she breathes life into him. And I'm like, whoo, God, God, raise my, raise my wife up in that. How could I get that? God has already given her a teacher. 
And so I am so, I, I, I trust and I, I know that God is so faithful to deliver, but, but at eight years old, I didn't know that. And so the only place I thought I had value was when I was playing sports and not just when I was playing sports, only if we played sports and I won and people told me how great I was because I'm desperately trying to get it from my daddy because you know that, that the father's love is so important. So that continues on until I was a, a, about 11 years old, not about exactly 11 years old, in a place just like this. It was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Comet Baptist Church, and the power team came in. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys remember the power team, but they would come into spaces like this, and they would stack up bricks as tall as I am, and they would stand on top of these things, and they would smash them in the name of Jesus, and they would put handcuffs on, and they would stand in front of you, and they would count down to 10, and, and people would pray for them, and then they would snap them, and they wouldn't say, I'm Macho Man Randy Savage, I'm Hulk, I'm, 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 I'm Terry Savage, go, go get your vitamins, go buy my t-shirts, no. There was a man that was standing in front of me and his name was Keith Kraft. He was six foot six, he had white hair, but he was doing supernatural things that I had never seen before. But he wasn't breaking handcuffs and standing there and saying, Keith Kraft is the greatest. He was saying in the name of Jesus, you can do the same things I can. You can pray like I can pray. You can have muscles like I can have muscles. And so I'm like this 11 year old boy and I'm like watching, my chin is on the stage and I'm like, Oh my God. It was the first time that I had seen a Christian that was attractive to me because all the other Christians that I had seen didn't look anything like you guys. They wore like khakis, they tucked their shirt in. I want, this is, this is for real. I want everybody who has a knife in their pocket to raise their hand. That is unbelievable. How many knives do you really need? Do you have a knife on right now? That's unbelievable. I don't need a knife or guns when I come here. I'm from Indiana, so I like definitely think they're super duper important, but not when I come here, because all of my friends have them. <laughs> this is incredible. Just don't, just don't ask how many guns are out there, because I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, whoa, whoa, Joe, my, my armor bearer said he, he didn't fly down here on purpose because he wanted to have his guns with him, so he drove 10 hours. <laughs> uh. And when he say, like, I'm going to give you an armor bearer, he's literally armored. <laughs> I mean, God bless this place, man. Woo. Um, so I didn't even introduce my family when I put that picture up there, but I wanted you all to see that. And I'll just kind of like circle back to this. Is, it's a bold statement for somebody to say, I submit to you. But I submit my marriage to Benet and I submit my marriage to Ivy because I see fruit in their life. And when I was 11 years old and I was standing right there and there was a man up here that was doing something that I wanted to be able to do. I wanna do marriage like you guys do marriage. Man, I want one day, I want my daughter to be standing right here with her arms open, praising the King of Kings, not worried about the judgment of other people. Dude, it wasn't until I was 36 years old, bro, before I cast off judgments of other people. My identity was so broken, I was always looking for something outside of myself to give me that validation. And then when I was 11 years old, a man came into my life and he showed me possibility. He showed me what a Christian could be. Like not just those dudes that have khakis on, and no offense if you have khakis on right now, I'm not hating, I got khakis too, <laughs> right? <laughs> but you need to have more than just khakis. Yeah. In, your, in, in, your, in your closet, because you need some calluses on your hands, right? So, 11 years old, I give my life to Christ, and everything shifted in an instant. I was given my identity. And I remember how it changed everything after that. Like, not just that Jesus lived inside of me, but I went home and I changed my Christmas list. I was like, Stretch Armstrong. Who remembers Stretch Armstrong in the Game Boy? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I took those off my list. I wanted a weight set, Wojo. I wanted a weight set because I wanted muscles like Keith Kraft. I went home and my mom got so mad at me. Every iron hanger in my house was destroyed because I was bending it over my head in the name of Jesus. <laughs> True story, dude. So like the decisions that I started to make after that, not just because Jesus came inside of me and gave me value, but in addition to that, I had a man wrapped in skin it was actually walking something out that was attractive to me. 
I didn't want to drive a station wagon to church the way that my parents did. I didn't want to like barely be able to like pay for shoes for me, two pairs of shoes per year, one for sports, one for school. I didn't want to live like that, man. And then you read all these stories that are like so old about God blessing people with favor and stuff. But I looked around my congregation and I looked at a bunch of homies that were broken, beaten and defeated and guys that were going to church. And I was almost sure hadn't been late in a year. You know what I mean? If we're just keeping it real, who wants to have a marriage like that? Can I, can I be real here? You're good. Is that okay? You're good. Okay, good. That's what I thought. Can I be real epic church? Come on. I'm a man, dude. I'm going to get a little physical, but Nate's helping me with that too. Come on, mama. <laughs> I mean, not helping me, but helping my wife help me. <laughs> um, man, I'm derailing, bro. I'm derailing. So, come on, come on. This is when I, that, that was 11, right? And, and then, then life got really real. Like, really real. I went to this new school. It was called Family Christian Academy, and I actually got a scholarship to go to this school. It was Jimmy Swaggart's school. I got a, I got a scholarship to go there because they saw me playing basketball at a tournament. I'm like, wow, if we could have this guy on our team, we'll let him go to school for free. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I go to this school. Two months into going to this school, there was a teacher that did a thing to me more than once, sixth grade, somebody stronger than me, somebody more powerful than me. Jesus came and lived inside of me a year, a year ago. I should be good, right? Things like this shouldn't happen to a little boy. Nobody should be made to feel that way. Think about that. The shame, the guilt, like the dirtiness that you feel, that shouldn't happen to somebody that like, that God loves. And so it was, it was then that I decided like, this Jesus thing's not real. If he loved me, he would have protected me. He wouldn't have let that man do that thing to me. And here's the deal. The same way he shows his scars so other people can heal, that's why I'm here to talk my business because I'm about my father's business. And so the things that happen to me are not the things that I am, but it is a part of my freedom story. Come on. So that happens at 12. All the while, I'm still struggling with this thing and trying to get this love from my dad. And we go through high school sports, and, and, and it wasn't like I was, I was athletic, but I was little. I was five foot eight. I was 108 pounds as a freshman in high school. And, um, and I, I started playing football just as a kicker. And that came very natural to me as a soccer player. And I'll never forget after playing football for one year, getting in the car with my dad with my father and I was fired up and I started to, to start to kick some distances that people were comparing me to guys that were in the NFL because it's very comparable. 55 yard field goal is a 55 yard field goal. And, and I got in the car because my friends were like, dang dude, that's 60 yards. The NFL record 63. So I get in the car with my dad. I'm like, dad, dad, I'll never forget it. Cause I got in the single cab truck. It was an S 10. They don't even make those anymore. Single cab manual transmission. And I'm sitting next to my dad, this 108 pound little turd. And I'm like, dad. And I'm looking at him, you know, like looking right in the face, except for he's, you know, shifting his gears, the stoic old school. I'm like, dad, dad, man, dude, I hit a 60 yard field goal today. Like, could you imagine when I get stronger, like how far I'll be able to kick it when I'm 18? Dad, I'm going to go to the pros. I I think I can do it. I can go to the pros. And I'll never forget, my dad never even turned to acknowledge me, he just said, I'll believe it when I see it, and just started shifting. And it was just, it, it crushed me, because here I am dealing with this thing that my dad didn't know about at 12, and like, I got no identity. And your dad is the one that's supposed to give you your value. He's supposed to give you your identity, right? At least that's what I thought. So I decided in that moment, that I'm gonna prove it to my dad, that I'm gonna earn it from my dad. At 15, he's like, well, believe it when I see it. Okay, game on. Three years later, I was a four-sport All-State, not just in football, four-sport All-State. And I'll never forget finishing high school and receiving an award for the most outstanding male athlete in the state and going to my dad with the award and just hoping and praying, dear God, Jesus, let him say he's proud of me. Dad, am I good? Is this enough, you love me? Don't get in trouble because you'll lose your scholarship. It was always the next thing. It was always like my dad was like 
trying to protect me, but not by not loving me too much, but not showing love to me. So I'm like, okay, that wasn't enough. Let me go to college and let me figure out what records I can break and, and things that I can become and, and I can earn it. I know, let me do some things my daddy thinks that, that can't be done. Go to college, all at the University of Illinois, all Big Ten, all American in football. Daddy, am I good? Is this, are you proud? Well, you said you're gonna go to the NFL. Okay, let me go, let me go run track, become an All-American in track. Daddy, am I good? Daddy, Daddy, are you proud? It's track, it doesn't mean anything. So then we get into the NFL and I knew my dad never thought I could make it to, into the NFL, but before I left for training camp, I had a conversation with him because I was going down to the New Orleans Saints and punters typically don't get drafted. And so, give me a napkin here. We, we get down, um, it's a day before I leave and it was the last conversation I had with my dad. And the guy that I was competing with to win the job in New Orleans is the punter. His name was Mitch Berger and he was an All-American. And my chances of winning were, honestly, they were very, very small. Um, but I'm about to leave for training camp and you don't need your dad to be realistic with you, right? <laughs> You're looking for your dad to give you, give you one of those like Rudy Rudiger speeches. And he's like, you know, the odds are up against you and you can do it. Just focus on what you can control. But my dad was different. He probably had a different father. He probably had a dad that was realistic, that squashed his dreams. And you know what? My dad might have been one of those people that just accepted what somebody spoke over them. And I know this room is filled with people who someone has spoken over your life. And I'm praying and believing that the freedom story that I'm talking to you about, about how Holy Spirit came in my life, wrecked me in the greatest way, and didn't just wash me off. He did a new thing in me. But I had to go through some suffering. I had to rejoice in some suffering because God wanted to build some endurance inside of me. Because he knew that one day that that endurance, that endurance would build character, enough character to be able to stand on a stage like this in front of people like you to, to, to say a story of how God did a thing in me and how he wants to do a thing in you. Yes. And he wants to meet you exactly where you're at. Yeah. There's a verse that's, that's in, um, in Romans, it's 12 too. And you actually shared it this weekend as well. And I, I believe it's, it, it's a word in season for this church right now, because you guys are the tip of the spear. This is a radical church. And that verse in, in Romans says, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing in your mind. That's what God wants to do in here today. Yeah. He wants to transform your spirit. He wants to transform your mind. And so you're no longer searching. You're no longer wanting for something outside of you to fill the hole inside of you the way that I was trying to fill a hole inside of me by getting the approval and by getting the love of my father. So I get into the NFL, daddy, daddy, I did it. I got an NFL helmet. I beat Mitch Berger. He's like, well, you understand as a rookie, your contract's not guaranteed, Steve. You only get paid week to week. And it was just another reminder, Steve, you ain't made it yet. I'm not proud of you yet. And I kept attaching a yet to it. Like eventually my daddy was gonna be able to fill the hole inside of me that somehow money and porn and drugs and addictions, because what do you think happened every time I would go up to my dad and ask him, is he proud? Am I good? And I would experience that feeling of rejection that nobody wants to feel. Because there's, I decided in my mind, there's only one person that can fill this hole. And so I set up a life that, that through achievement I could earn. And so I went into the NFL, I played my first year, I didn't get it, so I'm like, I thought to myself, I'm like, well, if I play for four years in the NFL, which like, that's a long time. I'm from Terre Haute, Indiana, nobody ever even makes it from my hometown. The NFL league average is 3.1 years. So if, maybe if I beat the average, maybe that'll do it. You guys know how that went. Daddy, am I good? The league average is 3.1. So then I decided, well, what if I could become the, the fittest man in the NFL? Because when you're a punter, you necessarily can't say, I'm gonna win a Super Bowl and actually have like great influence on the team. To be honest with you guys, I was way overpaid and I was like you, Garrett. I just had a front row seat, dude. And every <laughs> once in a while, they would let me touch the ball. That's a, pretty much what my job was. I mean, I was very, very good at it. So I'm not deprecating myself, but in regards to saying like, hey, we've got a Super Bowl champion football player coming in to speak to you guys. 
I'm a punter, okay? <laughs> I'm a soccer player who just so happened to they let me have a helmet. Um, so we play for four years, or, and then I become the NFL's fittest man, according to Muscle and Fitness, not once, but twice at the age of 27. Dad, Dad, look what I did. The NFL is filled with genetic specimens, and I took your genetics with hard work, with science, and I was able to do something that nobody else, there's 2,200 football players in the National Football League, and I'm the fittest of them all. I'm your son. Am I good, Dad? I did it, man. I'm the best. Am, am, are you proud of me? Nothing. Nothing. Then the next year I decided, well, my dad goes to church, right? You know? He loves this Jesus guy. You know, like the same Jesus guy that let me experience what I experienced when I was 12 and they made me feel that way? He loves that guy. And that guy's like generous, he's kind, he's giving. There's an award in the NFL called the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the, the NFL's most philanthropic guy. So I set my eyes on that. At 28 years old, I got that award. And I'm like, dude, this is definitely gonna get it. I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, the amount of money I make doesn't, doesn't impress him, how good I do at a skill, how much I develop my body, but maybe this Jesus guy, maybe I could, could, could be like him and that, and my dad would be like, finally, Steve, you get it. It's about other people. I thought for sure this one's gonna work. And I didn't think I was gonna win it because here's, here's the deal. They always give it to like quarterbacks. They always give it to like the popular people that people know. So I knew in order for me to win that award, I was gonna have to go way above and beyond what the other notable players were doing. And I freaking did it, man. And I won that award and I brought that award and I gave it to my dad. I said, daddy, I want you to put this in your office. I'm the most generous person in the pros. I'm the fittest man in the pros. Aren't you proud of me? Am I good? You love me, daddy. You know what he said? He said, well, you won this award because you took enough pictures and put enough on Instagram for people to see it, didn't you? I'm crushed, bro. I'm crushed. Everything I do is chopped in half and minimized. And in his mind, I'm sure he thought like, well, if I give him what it is that he wants, he's gonna stop doing all these great things. My dad didn't understand what I needed. My dad didn't understand what all little boys want. They just wanna be valuable. But I didn't know what to do because I didn't know who I was. And then we win a Super Bowl the very next year. So when you talk about stacking some unbelievably like demanding things to achieve on top of each other, fittest man in the NFL two years in a, in a row, most philanthropic man in the NFL, then we go into being a Super Bowl champion and we're playing and it's February 5th, 2012, the very next year, 47 miles, 47 miles from where I went to high school, dude, you know, 108 pounds in high school. And now I'm back. Everybody that I love is, is watching that game. My mom is there. My dad is there. My grandma's there. My brother's there. My other brother's there. My sister's there. My wife is there. My beloved son, in whom I am so well pleased, is there. He's four. My daughter's there. We're playing the New England Patriots, the mighty New England Patriots and Tom Brady. Nobody thinks we can beat these guys. And we'd go out there and play our tails off. I had the best game of my entire life. My very first punt was on the two-yard line, and the very next play was Justin Tuck sacking him in the end zone for the first two points of the Super Bowl, and he runs up to me. He's our team captain. He is like Mr. New York City. He's been with the Giants for like eight years, like four-time team captain. He runs up to the punter on the sideline. He picks me. I mean, you guys think I'm big, man. I'm a peewee compared to these dudes. They're bigger than you. He picks me off of the bench, and he picks me up. He goes, I never would have got that without you. It was just another example of a mighty man in my life giving me affirmation that because my identity was so jacked up, because of things that happened to me and also things that I've done to try to cope through those things. The pornography, every time I get rejected, it's to drugs, it's to porn. I needed something inside of my brain to make like good chemicals go off because I was so sad. I was so rejected. I was so lonely. I'm surrounded by oceans of people asking me for my autograph. I never thought a day would like that would come. Even if I made it to the pros, I'm a punter. 
But people cared about me like everybody cared about me. So you have all of this coming from outside. What's wrong with me? So I'll take you back to, to the Super Bowl. Man, I'm really running through these napkins for real. <laughs> um, and it's February 5th. Everybody that I love is there. I have the best game of my life. I just got affirmed by the guy on our team. And we go out there and it's halftime. And I don't know this at the time, but we're in the locker room. Meanwhile, Chris Collinsworth and Al Michaels are sitting there doing their halftime show. And Al Michaels says to Chris Collinsworth, I don't believe I've ever said this before, but if we picked an MVP at halftime, it would be the punter Steve Weatherford. I'm glad that they didn't have the TV on in the locker room because I would have fell out of my freaking chair. <laughs> This, we're talking about the Super Bowl, guys. We're talking about 124 million people watching you do what you worked so hard, what you sacrificed so long, what you were so disciplined to get the opportunity to do. And for some crazy reason, when the ball hits the ground, every single time that you punt, it doesn't bounce forward into the end zone. It bounces straight up and your teammates catch the ball and, and you literally break a record in the Super Bowl. And then after the game's over, I'm like scanning the, the crowd for my family. I'm like, where's my wife? You know, where's, where's my dad? Where's my family? And I spot them. My dad's like, my dad's running down. And I'm like, oh man, yeah, it's gonna happen. Run down. And right before he gets to the edge, he picks, I'm reaching for my dad. He reaches down and picks my son up and hands him to me. So I'm not disappointed by that. I'm like, okay, all right. So I pick my son up and I'll never forget as I'm pulling my son out of the crowd. And it's crazy. Like the confetti's coming down. And like my son, the first thing he says, he's like, daddy, we did it. We won. He doesn't know what's going on, but he knows it's a celebration. He knows the confetti coming down is giant's blue. He knows his daddy, just like that song we were singing all weekend and earlier today. My daddy's a champion. My dad is a champion. He's four, he didn't know, but he was proud of his daddy. So I remember pulling my son down, getting my, my mom through security, my grandma through security. I've got like my tribe of Weatherfords. And we walk up onto the stage. It's my turn to hold the trophy. And I got like a string of freaking rednecks from Indiana with me, man. I'm proud, dude. Half of them are chewing tobacco and one or two of them don't have a tooth. Man, those are my people, man. That's my family. So it's my opportunity. They give me the, they give me the trophy. It's my wife. It's my son. It's my daughter. It's my grandmother. And there's my dad. And I remember taking that trophy and walking by all of them and handing that to my dad and just praying to Jesus if you're real, let this happen. My dad holds it up and we take our picture and he hands it back to me. He said, that's nice. Okay, maybe he's gonna wait till later. Like it's where it's more private. He doesn't want to say it in front of people. So we go to the after party. Kenny Chesney, it's a room smaller than this. Kenny Chesney's on the stage, he's just rocking it, man. And I always told my wife, I'm like, man, if I ever win the Super Bowl, and this is when we were like teenagers, because I started dating her when I was 17. Come on. <laughs> and, uh, and I always told her, I said, baby, if we ever win the Super Bowl, I'm gonna get so ish-faced. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm like, I'm gonna get so wasted. And I remember drinking that first beer. And my wife is not the type of person to like give me additional drinks. She's usually like the moderator that tells my friends, no more, you know? So she goes to give me another drink and I remember her coming up to me and handing it to me. And I remember in that moment being surrounded by those people, I didn't want to feel any different because I had the people around me that I loved, but I knew that I had a hole inside of me. And so I remember telling her that was the first time that I declined a substance that would make me feel different. I knew that there wasn't a next level for me. And so I remember telling her, I'm like, no, baby, I'm good. And then I kissed my family goodbye at about two o'clock in the morning. I went back to my hotel room now in the NFL. Even when you win the Super Bowl, they don't let anybody come on to an NFL floor. You know, it was like NFL security and everything. So I get back to my room. I remember opening the door and walking in in Indianapolis. I walked past my bed, bathroom, and I remember walking up to a mirror. It was like full length like this. And I was on the 17th floor in Indianapolis. And I remember looking down and seeing an ocean of people in NFL jerseys and hats and like, you remember those big things, number one fingers running around? You know, people just having like the time of their life. And they weren't even wearing the NFL jerseys of teams that just played, they just were at a party. 
and they were drunk and they were having fun and they were high-fiving. And I just played in that game. I just had the best game of my entire life, in the biggest game of my entire life. And I remember looking down at them so happy, so fulfilled. And I remember taking a deep breath in. And before I could exhale that breath out, just depression came over me. And I knew in that moment that what else can I achieve to feel better? Because these drugs are just a cycle. Like every time I take a pill, and then I need two pills, and it doesn't feel as good as the first time I took the first one. And then you take three pills, and then you get to the point where you're taking pills just to feel normal, and then you get into the routine of, in your marriage, it's so broken, and your communication styles are so twisted that pornography is just a thing that you do. It's like part of your nighttime routine. Well, let me wait till my wife goes to sleep and then slip off into the bathroom because I've got this tiny little thing that she doesn't know about, and you know, it's a lesser of two evils. I'll cheat on my wife. And so literally in that moment, I just said this, this is how it's supposed to be because I'm different, you know, because things happen to me, but also like I'm, even before things happened to me, I was different. I felt, I've always felt like an alien. I've always felt like I don't fit in the box. And this is the part of the story that, where it gets good. This is where God really gets in and, and does a crazy thing. Yeah. So I played for three more seasons and I retired because I understand there is nothing inside of this. I go into media, I've got my own job on ESPN, I've got my own TV show on Spike TV, all of these things I'm still searching. Then we find out after two years of that, this isn't gonna work either. And my wife is like, you know what, we're moving to California. So we move out to San Diego and I find a church just like this one, this radical, this different, that wants to speak life into a struggle and they're not afraid to have somebody come on the stage and speak about some serious things. And this church convinced me to go to Emerge. Emerge is a men's event very similar to IM4, where a bunch of dogs get together in a tent. They bring real problems. They bring real transparency because they want real freedom. And they understand that there could be something inside of that tent in the desert that could change my everything. So I went and I brought my 11-year-old son. His name is Ace. You guys saw him on the picture earlier. And and the first speaker that came up was the main speaker. You remember I was telling you guys about Keith Kraft when I was 11 years old. After I got saved, he left and, and left my life because it wasn't like I followed him on Instagram. You know what I mean? There was no interwebs. <laughs> I wasn't Facebook friends with him. So he was out of my life. All that I had, the remnants of that, were like the one year where I was in love with Jesus and everything was gonna be okay. And then he was gone. And all I had was a poster to remember him by and then a speaker walked up and they hugged the speaker and the guy stood up here just like this. And I don't even remember the words that he said, but as soon as he spoke into that microphone, the spirit of the living God hit my body like a lightning bolt. And I started to like, like my skin started to crawl and I didn't know what it was. And then I asked the person next to me and my 11 year old son sitting right here, I asked the guy next to me, I said, what's his name? And I'll Google it. And it's the very same person that walked me through that 25 years earlier. So I'm like, oh my gosh. So he speaks his word and I don't remember anything that he says. But prior to him speaking, they gave us a burden and they wanted us to write everything that we wanted to leave in the desert and not bring back to our life. And so I wrote down some shameful things. I wrote down a porn addiction. I wrote down a sex addiction. I wrote down a pill addiction. I wrote down an alcohol addiction. Anything that would make my brain go numb or make me feel different, I was addicted to it. And so I wrote those things on this board and then they put a string on it. And you carry this thing around for three days. And so I'm sitting here in this uncomfortable chair with this freaking two by four on my back with all of the things that I'm embarrassed about, that I'm shameful about, that all the people sitting behind me can see. Everything. Because I wanted change. And I believe that people in here want change. Yeah. Like, don't let this just be a Sunday where some dude with some crazy hair and an earring flew in and spoke a word, made you feel a little bit excited or made you feel bad for him, and then he left. Let this be an opportunity where a seed is planted in season that can shift all of your tomorrows. So after Keith Kraft got done speaking his message that I know nothing about, I ran up to the front of that off, to the front of that tent because I was sitting about midway back because I wasn't real sure about men's conferences. I hadn't been to church in like 12 years because I worked on Sundays. So I remember him getting finished and I jumped out of my chair and everybody mobbed the stage. Think about 2,000 people, at least a 
300 of a mob to him as he's coming off the stage. So I'm grabbing dudes by the back of the net, like, like totally WWF kicking dudes out of the way. And I got to the front and I remember telling him how everything shifted when I was 11. How not just that I received Jesus Christ, but he sent me on a trajectory of excellence. Because in that moment when I was 11, he showed me possibility. Just how me coming here in Epic Church and serving at IM4, I was able to witness possibility of like what real marriage is like, dude. You know what I mean? Like what real partnership is like. So I've been served in a major way just from watching you guys. And so when Keith did what he did and I, and, and I just said, dude, I, I asked for weight sets and I ruined all my hangers and like all of the phone books in my entire neighborhood were torn in half, like bit by piece by piece, not all at once. <laughs> and he was like taken back and he's like, oh my gosh, take my number, let's talk later. And then the rest of the mob, you know, went after him. And I remember like walking back to my, my chair, like feeling like I was like levitating. And it was the first time that I knew, dude, like I knew that the, the spirit of God was real and I knew that he was conspiring in such a magical way to show me that he's proud of me, that my father is proud of me. And I'm walking back to my chair for the first time, feeling peace. Because I knew when Keith Kraft came back that that was God saying, dude, I've been with you the whole time. Everything that happened to you was for a reason and I'm gonna work all of it together for good. All of these things. What happened to you were at 12, I'm gonna work that for good. I'm gonna bless that man that did that to you. I'm gonna work all things together. I am, a, I am an artist of timing. I knew it when I was walking back to my seat, like God was real, peace was real. I was finally able to receive it. Because in that moment, I understand when my identity needed to be found. And I felt like that walk back to my chair was an hour. Because peace, man, I'd never felt peace like that. I had never felt like real forgiveness because when you don't know who you are, you can't receive something that powerful. You can't be justified in what you did or who you are. You can't. I tried. I tried to achieve myself to value. I tried to carve my body up to value. I tried to be generous to my value. There is only one way to permanent change. There is only one way to eternal life. There's only one way to peace. There's only one way to power. I thought it was the most amazing thing, lifting weights with you on Friday. And then six hours later, Tyrell, watching you give your existence to Jesus Christ. Bro, if it's only you, it's worth six months away from my family, man. Because you and I, we're marked for heaven, dude. We are FedEx sealed. The address has been stamped on us, man. I can't wait to see what God does in your life. Bill, same with you, man. I was in the weight room with you and six, six hours later, you're marked for heaven forever. And now we're neighbors in Texas, dude. We're about to build some kingdom, cuz. So I'm walking back to you. It's like God is like, God ain't done yet. Let me, let me put a little cherry on the top of this. This is how good. I'm walking back to my, my, my seat, feeling peace for the first time. And then I'm like, oh, I gotta find my son. I'm walking. <laughs> I'm searching. I'm like, my wife is gonna kill me. There's 2,000 men in here. I'm searching everywhere. I talked to Nick Unsworth. I talked to Connor Mead. I talked to all my buddies that are supposed to help me with my son. I searched everywhere. I look back up at the stage. My son gave his life to Jesus and he's standing right next to Keith Kraft. So you tell me God ain't real. You tell me God is not an artist of timing. And you tell me when the right people get in the right place and you're the right people. This is the right place, Epic Church, Decatur, Alabama. And this is the right time. The shame, the guilt, the things that happened, the things you've done, the things you've thought. That doesn't belong to you. Yeah. Jesus Christ justified you. Yeah. He can give you your identity, so if you're wondering what to do, once you figure out who you are and whose you are, game, set, match, Tyrell, I know what you and I are gonna be doing in a year. You wanna know why? Because this is the, not the last time you're gonna hear from me. 
We're a family now, man. You're marked for heaven. Same with you, Bill. IB, get up here, man. So Pastor IB is going to get up here. And we want to pray for some people. When we say the right people at the right place, at the right time, don't leave for tomorrow what can be done today. We're all those little boys and little girls. We all want that approval and love and peace from our Father. We can go through all these different places and all these different things to try to fix the hole that's inside of us. And I'm not just talking about sealing your eternity and making you a slave that drives a station wagon and, and khaki pants and tucks his shirt in. God wants you to be you, man. Yeah. He doesn't want you to be like I be or like me. Like he created you and designed you exactly how he wanted you. And it wasn't until I allowed like my sensitive emotion to come out that, that God actually really started to use me. And I found out, dude, it's not about my muscles. It's not about my abilities. It's not even about what I know. It's about how much I'm willing to trust. So like, what would your life be like if you took judgments and said, you don't belong to me anymore, what would your life be like if the addictions that you struggle with, that you just can't beat, what if you gave them to Jesus? What if you got out of religion? And what if you got into relationship? Because you have a father that just loves you, man. Like he's so proud of you. And he just wants to be with you in your struggle. He wants you to want him. He will take it all away in an instant. He will make a new thing out of you. Don't leave for tomorrow what can be done today. Receive, but you can't receive until you know that you're valuable. And so I was sent here to breathe life into you and your mission for these men. I was sent here to be energy for you. I was, I was sent here to support you and hold your hands higher. You guys don't understand this, but a year ago, I had never given anyone an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ. And he taught me this. And for the next 60 years, I'm marked by Ivy Marsh because he taught me to do a thing. And when I get to heaven, I'm telling y'all right now, that line's gonna be long and not because of me, because of the thing that Jesus Christ did in me. And I will live forever, forever, forever telling people like Tyrell and Bill O'Brien what Jesus did in me. Because he wants to do it in you. He wants to take you new levels. He doesn't want you to pull the baggage and pull the weight of any of those things anymore. So um, if you'd bow your head and close your eyes and just, um, just trust God in this moment. Just trust Jesus in this moment. If you're under the sound of our voice, whether you're online or in this auditorium, and you've never like for real, giving your life to Christ. Not, not a self-help program, but a surrender to Jesus. We want today to be the day of your salvation. And if you know that's you, I just want you to put your hand up wherever you're at in the auditorium. Yeah, One, two, three, stick your hand up wherever you're at in this auditorium. leave for tomorrow guys Four. do it today listen if you put your hand in the air I want you to do um, yeah thank you Jesus I'm going to ask you to stand up but in this church we don't stand alone so when I count to three I want you to stand up and all your brothers and sisters in this auditorium are going to stand up with you one two three everybody stand up don't let anybody stand alone you stood up yeah thank you Jesus you raised your hand in the air the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You receive what Steve's been talking about this whole time. So if that's you, I just want you to pray this. When you pray to yourself, you pray it out loud. Just say, Jesus, I just give my life to you. I believe that you died for my sin. On the third day, you rose to life again. God, be Lord of my life. You run the show, not me. Now say, Holy Spirit, come and dwell in me. There's another group of people in here I want to talk to because the surprise that Benet was talking about is that we are going to open the baptismal tank after right now during the service. 
And if you made a decision this weekend to give your life to Christ, or you made a decision right now to give your life to Christ, we would love the opportunity to baptize you today. Come on. The Bible says that once, you, once you're saved, baptism comes after that moment. And it's just a public declaration that you make to say, I belong to Jesus. Jesus saved me and I'm his. Um, and we don't believe baptism saves you. We don't think scripture teaches that. But we also don't believe it's something you can take or leave and do if you feel like it. God says, now be baptized. So if you made the decision today to give your life to Christ or this weekend or at some point but you've never been baptized, we would like the opportunity to forge you the opportunity to follow Jesus in baptism. Now here's the deal. The team outside these doors have shorts and t-shirts and everything for you. The only thing standing between you and getting in that tank is you. Because we want to celebrate with you. So I'm going to pray that you're going to have courage and then when I say amen, I want you to just walk to, um, it'll be your far right, my far left exit sign back there. There's a team waiting on you. They'll take care of you. We're going to celebrate you. But don't be worried that anybody's going to judge you, especially if you've been in church for a long time, or you've taught small group, or you were on the worship team, or you, you served in a booth. It does not matter. The most important decision you can make is to cast off shame and judgment and give your life to Jesus. So, Father, would you give these people courage that raise their hand to take their next step? For those who made the decision this weekend to take their next step, God, let them know that all of heaven is cheering them on, and we are too. God, when I say amen, give them the courage to step out wherever they are and walk to the back of the room. We'll meet them there to guide them. In Jesus' name, amen. So if that's you and you raise your hand, step out. Step out. Come on. Back. It's all right. Be celebrated. I see you thinking Be about it. Be celebrated. Talking it over. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on, champions. Come on, go. Come on, champions. Come on, champions. While those people are getting ready, I want to I wanna open the altar up, and I'm going to ask Steve to do something. There's some people in here who are here today that struggle with addiction, and that looks like that's a lot of different ways, so I'm not going to go through the list, but you know something controls your life. And more than that, there's people in here who struggle with shame, and you can't forgive yourself, and you're letting that thing drag around. I believe Steve is anointed for this moment yes. to just pray and speak life into you and over you. So if that's you, I want you to come down to the altar. I want you to just come down front right now. One, two, three, just step out and come down front. You struggle with an addiction. You struggle with shame, guilt. You got something on you that you do not want to follow you out of this building. I want you to come on down front. I know there's more than one. Come on. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Addiction, shame, guilt, struggle, identity, whatever it is. Come on. Come down front. As he's coming, I'm just going to ask Steve to step into his anointing as a son of God and pray over these people and speak over them. And we're all going to believe, because you're going to stretch out your hands toward these people, we're all going to believe that God's delivering them today, setting them free, and they're not going to walk out of here with the same thing they came in. As you're sitting in your seats right now, and you're watching people walk up, I'm just praying and believing right now, Holy Spirit's going to stir you up right now. And he said, he's saying right now, you too, you too. So I'm just going to wait about 15 more seconds. And if you know that's you too, just get up here. Just like me for so many years, I wasn't willing to receive. Holy Spirit wants to meet you up here. It's 15 steps to freedom in the name of Jesus. right now no weapon formed against us shall prosper it doesn't say no no weapon will be formed so we speak against those weapons right now that they shall not prosper we speak freedom we speak peace 
We speak power. We speak provision in the name of the almighty God, undefeated. And we're just believing that you're going to meet these men and these women, these little boys and little girls right where they're at. That no addiction is too small. That no thought is too intimidating. And you're just going to meet them where they're at. You're going to love them. You're going to love them right through it. So we thank you for these children, these sons and daughters of the one most high. And we seal them. And we speak victory over their families. We speak victory over their mind. We speak victory over their soul. We speak victory over their hands that you will bless them. We speak victory over your feet that you would guide them. We speak victory over their tongue that you will guide their words. And you will bring men and women into their lives that will secure them, that will affirm them, that will love them and show them agape love. So we love you, Abba Father. We love you for the way that you're moving in this space. We, we, we're thankful for that you're the only way to permanent change. So we thank you for the favor that is upon these people who have so boldly come up to this altar. And they're just declaring in the name of Jesus that they can't do it. That they want to create a partnership, a perfect partnership, not in a religion, but in a relationship with their father. So we thank you for the way that the, the way that you're raising up their level and the ability to receive by giving them an identity founded in Jesus Christ. So we thank you for doing all these things and for being an undefeated almighty God. And every single person inside of that big church raises their hands right now and declares in the name of Jesus. Yes. Amen. I have three things. So the first thing I just really feel like if you're in here and you have something on you that you feel like you haven't been able to release, I want you to be bold. If you've got something that you've brought in with you, if it's a bottle of pills, if it's a bottle of alcohol, if it's your phone, if, if it's uh, uh, whatever it is, if it's meth, if it's marijuana, whatever it is, I want you to be bold. I want you to go get it. And, and we want to allow you an opportunity just to physically put it on this stage as a picture that you're completely released from this. Second thing, I just want you women to know, I am so proud of you. You are God's daughters. And you, and, and you look at me and you look up to me and I'm just a forgiven daughter too. I made so many bad choices and I never thought I could be free from those choices. Abby and I had two abortions before we were married and I carried that guilt and shame around and so I'm living proof that you're looking into my eyes that you can be absolutely free and God will use anybody because we're all his daughters. And I'm so proud of you women. So proud. You're not alone. Third, marriages that are in here. Women, if you're scared to death, you know, what's God done in my husband's life? I, don't, I can't measure up. I'm afraid. What's he going to do? How is he going to be now? How, how do I submit to him? I don't even like the word submit. If there are any marriages in here that are struggling, I just invite you right now just to come up because Abby and I want to pray over you. So if your marriage is struggling, just grab your wife, grab your husband by the hand. Men, grab your wives by the hand and walk on up front. Anybody in here? Anybody in here? Okay, I see some coming. Anybody in here? I see some more coming. I see some more coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Thank you. Please come right down here so we come, come right around here if you don't mind. I'm so proud of y'all. God's going to do something extra special because that takes courage. That's humility, and God says He gives grace to the humble. So there's a special grace anointing that's flowing on you right now. So Father, me and Ivy just come together, and I just come up under my husband as a helpmate fit perfectly for him, and we come into agreement. You say whenever we stand in agreement, you command a blessing. So Father, we just pray over these marriages right now, Father. We just pray that anything that's happened in the past, that can be let go, it can be forgiven right now, because love keeps no records of wrong. Father, we pray blessings over them. We pray peace over them. We pray joy over them. We pray recreated love over them. These are your sons and daughters, Father. God, I just want to speak a word over these husbands that stand on this altar today. They've humbled themselves and come before you. 
that God, that they would step in and step up to be the leaders in their marriage and their homes. Not a tyrant and not a dictator, but a servant leader. One who understands prophet, priest, king, and warrior that makes their wives feel safe and secure and loved, that they would wash them in the word and love them in a special way that they need to be loved. But then, God, that you would be their substance of strength, that they would turn to you as sons and not do this out of performance or agenda, but do it as a humble servant unto their king that their wives would benefit from. God, I declare that these marriages today are healed and whole. Yes. That, God, the, the problems that they bring down here will not be the problems that they take away from here. But, God, they will literally become a deeper one flesh today because of this decision. And that, God, generations will be affected because yes. of this decision. Yes. Homes will be affected because of this decision. Communities will be affected because of this decision, God. That you would be glorified in this moment. Because, God, your word says that the gates of hell cannot stand against your church. And, God, you use marriages to communicate to the world what you are the uh, groom and we are the bride. So, God, I declare that the gates of hell will not stand against these marriages, that no attack of the enemy will prosper in these marriages. But, God, they will be sealed together today as one unit, one flesh, to forge your kingdom not only in their world but in the world that surrounds them. In Jesus' name. And I just want to speak to everybody that's online with us. The team let me know. We have Africa. We have England. We have India. We have all type of states throughout the United States that are represented. If God's spoken to your heart, you're not alone. We can't see you right now, but God can see you. So please let Alex know because we want to pray for you. Thank you for being with us today and staying with us. God has something special for you too. Oh, it's me. Okay. There you are. I was like, where'd he go? I had to go check on baptism. Sorry. Okay, all right. So if you guys want to make it back to your seat, we're going to celebrate. I think we have about five people that are going to be baptized today. Um, so so a, couple of, a couple of requests I'll have. Um, one, somebody get word to the children's department that I apologize. Um, and then secondly, um, if you guys will just, just kind of hang and... and and be still as we um, engage in this holy moment. Um, at Epic Church, because we believe nobody stands alone, even if you don't know the person of this tank, um, they're spiritually your brother, your sister. We invite you to gather around the tank and encourage them and celebrate them. If this is like your first Sunday with us, um, we don't always do this, but when we do, we join with heaven and we celebrate the way heaven celebrates when one person gives their life to Christ. So we're going to lose our mind in here when they come up out of the water, and that's okay. You should have fun in church. You should celebrate life change. This is what... This is the reason Jesus came, was to destroy the works of the devil, set people free, and give them his life. And that's what we're celebrating today as these people come. And before we uh, move that way, Steve, we just want to tell you, we love you. We are so proud that God chose us to walk with you. And Laura, you're an amazing couple with amazing kids. And God's going to continue to do great things. You are anointed and you are appointed for such a time as this. And so is Laura. You have a beautiful helpmate that's completely fit for you. Thank you for sharing your heart with us today. All these people were impacted and thousands online. So thank you so much. We love you. We honor you. We pray blessings over you. I'm proud of you. All right, guys, we have Maverick coming today. I do, I do know that Maverick made a decision to give his life to Christ um, at the I Am 4 conference, but he wanted to wait till his mom could be with him here today. God, I thank you so much for Maverick. Father, we're so proud of him, but God, you are pleased with him, and he is your son. God, even at his young age, let him be an example in his faith and his commitment to the kingdom. God, we call out prophet, priest, king, and warrior in this young man. I thank you that he has a mom and a dad who are going to pour into him and love him unconditionally. But let him understand that he has a father in heaven who loves him and is with him and will never leave him and never forsake him as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. next coming. You guys give it up for Teddy. And 
Teddy wrote down some of these stories. He said, Jesus is leading me in the right direction. He has shown me that I can't find peace in the bottom of a bottle. I can finally see clearly and no longer feel like I'm looking through a tunnel. I want to lead and live a better life and put God first. I know he will help me lead and live a better life. Everybody celebrate Teddy. Jesus, we thank you so much for Teddy and the revelation of where true love is found and God, it's found only in you. God, I just speak clarity over his mind and his soul that your Holy Spirit would wash him right now from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and fill him to overflowing. God, it is our honor to call, speak into and call out of this Son of God, prophet, priest, king, and warrior. God, that he will walk in his identity, that he will rejoice in who you are in his life, and he'll also rejoice who he is as a son as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want you to help me celebrate Miss Julia Pearson. She said she just got out of jail for 21 days, and today is her first time at Elk Epic. Welcome, Julia, part of our family. The message about addiction not defining me spoke to me, and I want God to do good through me. Hey, Julia. Hey, Julia. Hey, Julia, up here. <laughs> You are good. God loves you. He's not ashamed of you. He's proud of you. You are his daughter. He created you with a fingerprint to leave an imprint that no one else can, as Pastor Keith says. You are free. You can walk in that freedom. We are so proud of you. God, we thank you so much for Julia. We thank you that, um, as Steve said, you are an artist of timing. And God, it's not a mistake that she came today, that you orchestrated everything in her life to bring her to this moment. So God, I just pray that she knows deep down in her soul and her heart that she has a Father in heaven who loves her and has pursued her all the days of her life for this moment right now to adopt her into your family, God, through the blood of Jesus. May your Holy Spirit wash her mind and her heart and her soul and heal her right now as we baptize her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. coming next, is that correct? What's up, Ashton? Come on, man. Father, we celebrate young Ashton coming today. God, I just, I love the fact that you encourage young men through your word to call them to, even though that they're young in their age, that they can still be an example in their faith. And God, I just thank you that Ashton is gonna walk as prophet, priest, king, and warrior. He may not have it all figured out, but God, you're gonna use him to be a power source in his school, around his friends. Holy Spirit, fill him to overflowing as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Next, we have Sean coming. Come on, Sean. And Sean says, God gave me a baby boy named Josiah. I've been addicted to porn, and I'm ready to give my life fully to Christ. It took me 40 years of my life to realize it. Celebrate Sean Cosby. Come on. Come on. Come on, Sean. Let it go, bro. I thank you so much for Sean's humility. And God, your word says you give grace to the humble. 
So I speak grace over his mind and his heart. God, this thing that's held him captive for so long, I just pray release over him, freedom over him from this addiction. And God, whatever pain he's using to numb, using this thing to numb, I speak healing into that pain in Jesus' name. God, you paid for it. He doesn't have to carry it around. So God, I just pray, Holy Spirit, you wash over us. And God, when he goes down into this water and comes back up, he knows he comes up as a new creation, forgiven, past, present, and future, restored, redeemed, and made whole through the blood of Jesus Christ. That God, he'll walk as prophet, priest, king, and warrior, not to try to do something, but because that's who he is in his father's house. So God, would I declare greatness over him. I declare freedom over him. God, do something special in his heart as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Epic helps me celebrate Zion Moore, who she's coming in right now. She said, Jesus has showed me who he is and who and what he can do, and I need this. And Zion, we are so proud of you. God, we thank you so much for this woman of God. Miss Zion stands here today in boldness to declare she is a daughter of the King, adopted by the blood of Jesus. So, Father, I speak life into her and I release her gifting into the earth as a daughter. Holy Spirit, wash over her and fill her to overflowing as we baptize her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. celebrate Aiden coming to the tank this morning. Aiden says, God has helped me through some dark places with addiction and has really showed me how to live life and to be the best me that I can be. That's good. Father, we just stand here in agreement with Aiden. And God, the men of this house, I just call us to stand at this moment in agreement in a righteous anger to the world that is entrapping young men. And God, as we said this weekend, we say no more over Aiden. No more whatever this addiction is will control him. No more will he feel shame, and no more will he feel rejected, but he will feel accepted by his Father in heaven. God, name, put your name on him as prophet, priest, king, and warrior right now. Holy Spirit, wash him and fill him as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jason coming to the tank this morning. Jason said that God has helped him to see that drugs was destroying his family and himself. He helped him to also see that all the gray areas and reading between the lines are not good and to close all of that up and be no more gray lines, no more. Yeah. Father God, we thank you so much for Jason. and God, we thank you that there will be no more shades of gray in his life, but only the clarity of pure white as you wash him white as snow from the blood of Jesus. God, we speak healing over him, deliverance from the thing that's trapped him all of his life. God, I pray you renew his mind miraculously right now in the name of Jesus and set him strong in the kingdom as prophet, priest, king, and warrior as we baptize him in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Church, that's the last one for this weekend. Can we give God some glory?